Good. All right. Good evening. In our Wednesday night uh, prayer time and Bible study here at Central Baptist Church. And uh, hopefully we have a lot of folks join in with us here on our online platform. It's kind of weird in here tonight. All I have is Pastor Taylor here with me and my wife. And uh, so we've got a very small in-studio audience, but uh, I know God's going to be with us, and we're going to be encouraged from His Word tonight, so I'm glad that you're joining with us. Let me give you just a couple of uh, real quick announcements before we get into opening up in prayer and doing our programs this evening. Um, this Sunday morning, Lord willing, we are planning on going back to our in-person uh, services for our church hour as well as for our adult Sunday school hour, all right? So this Sunday morning, we'll be back in person for adult Sunday school and morning worship. Uh, there will not be any children's uh, services for uh, Sunday school or for the uh, church hour. Everybody going to solve this. Everybody gathers here in the auditorium, uh, but that is okay. This Sunday, we are going to have our youth testimony service from camp. And so our kids that went to camp, we're going to hear from some of them and get a couple of uh, some testimonies, as well as uh, watch a video of, uh, of their time away at church camp. All right. So I hope you'll join us for that. If you feel comfortable coming in person, we would love to have you. If not, that service will be broadcast on our live stream through Facebook, as well as through YouTube. All right. I'm going to share a number of programs with you tonight. And Pastor Taylor is going to come and uh, pray over these folks and open us up. Uh, tonight in prayer, and uh, as of course as we pray for these folks, please pray with us. But if you're watching tonight, please put your name in the comments section, and everybody that's there in the in the room with you, so that we can know everybody that's praying for these folks. We'll be sending them a letter with all of your names on that uh, tomorrow morning uh, as a way of encouragement to let them know that Central Baptist Church is lifted them up before the Lord. All right. So our first one tonight is Miss Janie Salazar. This is David and Nina's mom. She suffered a stroke this week and uh, is having, of course, some complications. She has a procedure tomorrow uh, to clear out her carotid arteries in her neck. So we want to pray for that. Um, she's also on dialysis and this has kind of uh, made that a little difficult as well. So pray for Miss Janie tonight. We also want to pray tonight for Miss Deborah Bickle. Deborah is, of course, one of our missionaries there in Costa Rica, and we want to lift her up tonight in her ministry. We also want to pray for a gentleman named Mark Peckham. Uh, this is a friend of Brad Carpenter's. Uh, Mark was just re recently diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. We want to pray for him as he begins treatments tonight. We also want to pray for one of our own, Miss Joanne Henley. Uh, Joanne is uh, recovering from an accident and uh, some issues with her leg and ankle foot. Been on a scooter for a while. She's uh, off of that, but she still has about three weeks left in a boot and about another eight weeks left uh, for a full recovery. So we want to lift her up tonight. And then uh, Lee Baker and Sherry Triplett, also some of our members, both have uh, requested just some unspoken requests for some personal things uh, with them this evening. We want to pray for them. Uh, and then Brandy Hudson. Brandy is uh, the wife of Pastor TJ there at Agnes, and she's been extremely sick for a few days and waiting on uh, results from some testing for COVID and different things. But just extremely sick tonight. We want to lift her up. And then, of course, remember uh, several of our members with ongoing illness with cancer, uh, Cammy and LaFon, Brother Larry, uh, and then Ms. Jim Rawls uh, had, a, had a minor procedure this week. Uh, as well and recovering from her heart issues. So we want to keep them in prayer as well and also pray for them in that service. Good evening, Good evening church family. Let's all uh, pray right there in our in our living rooms, wherever we are. Uh, we're just, it's us praying to the Lord tonight as a church family. So let's go to the Lord and pray together. Father, we thank you so much and I, I love you, Lord, and I thank you for just everything that you've done for me, for this church, for our church family, watching over our family, Lord. And I just thank you for the love that you pour out for this church family, Lord. And tonight, we just want to bring some folks to you, Lord. We think of uh, Janie Salazar right now as we lift her up. And uh, Lord, you know the, the details there, Lord, but she's had a stroke. She's had a, some things going on this past week, Lord. And uh, Lord, I just... We just lift her up to you, Lord, and we lift the doctors up because tomorrow she's going to be going through a procedure. I think it's another procedure. And, uh, Lord, so we just lift up Janie to you. I think of Deborah Bickle. 
our missionary to Costa Rica, Lord, her and her parents, but specifically tonight, we, we lift up the retreat that they do down there as you just continue to watch over uh, Costa Rica uh, and uh, the children's home and everything that's going on down there, the feeding center and everything, the, the many things that they're doing down there to just reach kids and, and other family men, families and, and just reach people for Christ, Lord. So we lift up the pickles to you tonight, Lord. Uh, Lord, tonight, um, Mark, we lift up Mark, uh, Brian Carpenter, uh, sent this in, Lord, and he was diagnosed with, a, with just an aggressive cancer, Lord. And so we lift up Mark to you tonight, Lord. Give him to you. Um, Lord, you are the great physician, and you can take care of this, this ugly C word, Lord. Um, but, uh, Lord, you are the father of miracles, and you can take care of it, Lord. But we just lift up Mark to you tonight. And we've got Joanne uh, Henley here, Lord, uh, just healing from some things that have been going on with Joanne. And um, she's been on a scooter and different things, Lord. And so we just pray, Lord, for total healing. Uh, and, Lord, that we just give her to you and we pray for that healing. Once again, Lord, you're the great physician. You can take care of it. We lift up the uh, Lee Baker and Sherry Triplett, Lord, and some different things going on in their lives right now. Just some requests, personal requests, Lord. You know what they are. They've been praying to you as you're listening to them. And so we just lift them up to you tonight, Lord. We think of Brandy Hudson, Lord, uh, the pastor's wife up there in Agnes. Lord, we just you. She's got an illness. They don't exactly know what it is. So, Lord, we just ask that you be with the doctors, be with uh, everything there on the testing and things, Lord. And just, Lord, we just ask, help them find it, exactly what it is, Lord, so that uh, medicines and whatever needs to happen there, Lord, Lord, we know you are in control. Lord, as we take a breath tonight and we lift up these individuals to you, and we do lift up our other church members that are, I think, of Julie Rawls right now, a, a procedure she just had done with her heart and different things there. Think of Cammie and LaFon and just all those that we have been praying for as you continue to be with them and those families and comfort them. Father, we pray for this wonderful ministry pray for our pastor and his family. We pray for the leadership. We pray for the deacons uh, and the trustees and just different things that are going to be going on with decisions and all this thing, all these things, Lord, that you are ultimately in control of. And so we, we give this wonderful ministry to you, Lord. We also pray for this country. We pray for the leaderships of this, in this country. We pray for our president, our vice president. Um, we pray for their families. We pray for the decisions that are being made from at the highest level when it regards to this uh, this virus, Lord, in this country, Lord. But once again, ultimately, we know that you are in control. And we give it all to you, Lord. We love you, Father, tonight. Just ask a special blessing and power, the Holy Spirit power over our pastor as he comes, open up your word to us and share it with us tonight. We love you. Father, we ask all these things in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Thank you, Pastor Taylor. Well, again, it is good to see you online. Glad that you were watching from your living room or back porch or wherever, wherever you might be uh, tuned in tonight. And I would encourage you, as, as always, that uh, the presence of God to be with us, whether we're gathered together in person or whether we're using uh, an electronic format, God has a message I will lay for us tonight, and I'm glad you're here with us. Uh, before we get into tonight's uh, message, I, I've got, a, uh, I guess, a confession uh, to make to you tonight. I need to, I need to confess something to you. Uh, Wednesday night, I, I inadvertently told just a, maybe kind of a minor lie. It's one of those lies. I didn't mean to tell it. Um, I, I really meant it at the time, but uh, but things have changed, and so uh, I, I kind of maybe maybe just misspoke last week. But last week I told you that it was that it was the end, the final message in the series that we've been on. We've been in a series uh, called Redeeming the Time, and we've been considering all the different things. Look about eight different topics of things that are really important for us to focus our time and attention on. And I told you last. Wednesday night, that uh, the last Wednesday was the last message in that series, and I really thought that it was going to be, um, but uh, but some things have changed this week, and uh, I actually was not supposed to 
be here tonight. I was supposed to be in Venice, Louisiana on a fishing trip with some men in the church and uh, on a tropical uh, thing that's going on in the Gulf, kind of postponed that for a couple of weeks. And so uh, as a result of that, I had asked Pastor Kaler to fill in for me. And he and I, uh, when I asked him about that, uh, we were talking and he said, you know, I think I, I want to I want to do a message on worship, and he says, in, in about worship time, and he said, you know, what, what God put on his heart just really fit in with the series, and I'm like, man, that's, that's fantastic, that sounds great, and then my trip got canceled, and I came back to Pastor Kaler, and like, bud, you can, uh, you know, I'm going to be here, but you can still teach it, he said, you know, I don't think I want to teach to a camera, and uh, and so anyways, we, we begin to talk, and and I said, man, if you don't teach, I'm going to steal your topic because it, it just really fits right in with this series that we've been in and the importance of worship. And so so uh, I misspoke last week when I said the series was over. Tonight, I think, is the last series, sermon in this series about redeeming the time, all right? And uh, I think I talked about worship uh, and kind of planted that seed and that burden in my mind for tonight's message. And so uh, I, I had to get creative to be able to keep that in line with the alliteration. You know, everything we've talked about thus far started with a G. We talked about God time and group time and gather time and go time and game time and generational time, uh, game time and giving time uh, and, and game time. And so tonight we're going to talk about glory time. Glory time means our time where we worship. And I want you to know tonight that, that worship ought to be something that permeates all of our time. You know, everything else we've talked about, we've talked about things in the spiritual realm, we've talked about things in the physical realm. All of those are things that we don't necessarily do all the time, right? They're things we have to schedule in to our daily life and into our weekly schedule. You know, we schedule that time for church or small group or we schedule you know, we're not always in church. We're not always working. We're not always with our family. We're not always resting. Those are things we kind of schedule in. We have to balance them out. But when it comes to glory time, a time where we worship, the reality is this, is that all of our time ought to be glory time. Everything that we do, every moment of every day, ought to be done and it ought to be lived and really just in a heart and an attitude of worship and giving glory unto the Lord. I invite your attention tonight, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures we have over the last eight weeks, and uh, they'll be on the screen behind me. You can look them up in your Bible there with you. But 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the Bible says this, that whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Paul makes it very clear. He says, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if you're having your God time. You know, it makes sense that in God time I'm going to worship. But what about in our uh, in, in our game time or our giving time? What about when I'm with uh, having my family time or even my, my, my game time, my rest time? In all of those times, in all of those moments, God's word says we are to worship. Everything about us ought to be done in an attitude of worship, giving God Webster's Dictionary, back in 1828, the 1828 edition of Webster's Dictionary is one of the best definitions of worship, I think, that I have uh, recently come across. In that edition of Webster's Dictionary, it says that worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. And to honor with extravagant love and, and extreme submission. Submission. So we are to live every moment of every day with an extravagant love for God, worshiping Him. And we're to live every moment of every day uh, with this extreme submission to Him. That God, I love you above all things. And God, I submit myself to you in all things. And if we can learn to worship God like that in every moment of every day, if we can learn to, to worship God uh, with, our, with our work and with our finances and with our family and with our church uh, and, and with our recreation, it will be a game changer, life changer for all of us. What would I want us to understand tonight about worship and about this glory time is that worship, it, it is an attitude of the heart. It is an expression of a holy lifestyle. 
It's not about rituals. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts. It's, it's not about uh, legalistic matters. It's an issue of the heart. It's an attitude that is projected uh, in our actions. It is, it is living a holy lifestyle before the Lord. If you go to John 4, 21 through 24, you know this story of Jesus there at Jacob's well in Samaria, and he's talking to that woman there at the well. And, of course, she's got a very corrupted history, a, a, a bad a, a bad life. She, she's been uh, an adulterous woman. And, uh, and here Jesus is speaking to her and revealing himself to her. But in their, their conversation, Jesus says this to her. He says, woman, believe me, the times when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus simply tells her, listen, you know, a lot of folks regulate worship to a to a or to a specific location. We get in our, in our mind that we can only worship here and we can only worship if we use this music or we do this thing. But Jesus says, listen, that's not what God's looking for. God's looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth, meaning that they will worship him with every moment of every day, with every element of their life, that they will see the opportunity that regardless of what they're spending their time doing, that in their spending and whatever they are doing, they are able to do it to the honor and the glory of God. And so I want us to just go through a number of thoughts tonight and a number of scripture about what is worship. Number one, I want you to know this, that worship is about giving God glory. And by the way, I want you to know it is, it is just kind of inherent in our nature that we want to worship. That is, God has placed that desire within us. And one of our biggest issues is that we displace that worship or we worship the wrong things. Too many times we worship our work or we worship our recreation or we worship our money or we worship our positions. And, and God says, listen, he doesn't want us to worship those things. He wants us to worship him. And he wants us to use those things, our work, our possessions, our money, our relationships. He wants us to use those things to worship him and to glorify him in those things, right? So worship is all about giving God the glory. But let me let me ask you this question: Is we understand that worship is about giving God the glory? What is our motivation for worship? Do we worship God because of what He has done for us, right? And I think this is probably an easy thing for any of us. It's easy. To worship God when you feel like He's blessed you, right? When He gives you, uh, when He gives you that new possession, when He, uh, when, when you are healthy, home, when life is good and the job secure and there's money in the bank, it's easy to worship God in those moments, right? We get in our mind sometimes that we only worship when things are good. But I would submit to you this: that's not the right motivation for worship. We shouldn't worship God because of what He has done for us. And somebody can say, "Well, preacher, I'm going to worship God because He because He gave me salvation." And again, I tell you, that's a good thing. And we all praise His name for that. But they, even that is not motivation for worship. I'll tell you what, with the motivation for worship ought to be, it shouldn't be because of what God has done for us. We should worship God because of who He is. We should worship God for who he is. That should be the very foundation, the very motivation, the very reason that we worship is simply because of who God is. Go with me to Psalms chapter 96 this evening. Psalms 96. And, uh, and, and listen to what the psalmist says. He says, oh, come. Let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise uh, unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. And his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. 
Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tipped me and proved my word. Forty years long, I was green with this generation and said, it's the people that do err in their heart and they do not know my ways. So who am I swear my wrath? They should not enter in my rest. God said, listen, and worship him, not because of what he's done, but because of who he is. That's why the psalmist speaks and he, and he tells us to come and to sing and to, and to make noise and, uh, and, and to praise his name. Why? Because he's a great God, a great king. He owns everything. That's why the Bible says to come and worship and bow down before him. He is our maker. He is our God. We should worship simply for who he is. That's why John in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, he said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The motivation for our worship is simply this, because he's God. And because God is God, we understand that he has given everything to us. He's giving us the he talked the last eight weeks about time. Who gave us time? God did. When God created this world and he set the, uh, the, the, the sun and the moon and stars to divide the night and the day and to, and, and to give us that 24-hour period, he gave us time. That's God's gift to us. He's given us everything that we have. He's given us the families that we possess. He's given us the work that we're able to do. He's given us the ability to do that Work. We've learned how he's, he's the one that's given us the ability to gain wealth and to provide. He's the one that has given us the, the uh, opportunity to have recreation and rest. And it's God that has given us everything. Therefore, we worship him. Not just because he has given it, just because of who he is. We would have nothing if it weren't for God. And God has done what he has done for us, not because we are worthy or deserving, but simply because of who we he deserves our worship. I will tell you tonight, as we understand this reality, we worship God, we worship Him with every aspect and element of our life. Everything we do can be used as a time of worship. And so, as we understand that, we need to know this tonight, that worship is both a public and a private matter. Right? God has called us to worship Him at all times, in all things, in every way. And we need to understand that we're they're called publicly as well as privately. Uh, publicly is, is a fairly obvious thing, right? That is, that is when we have corporate worship, when we gather together as a church. And I cannot wait for us to gather together as the church without the rows blocked off, without having to separate ourselves from each other. I can't wait for us to gather back together as the church because there's power in that worship. There's power in the gathering. And God said in Hebrews chapter 10, we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We ought to desire to be with one another because there's power there. There's something magical and powerful and spiritual that uplifts us and transforms us when we as God's people can gather together in a location and just gather in his name there's power that takes place when we lift our voices in song when we join our hearts in prayer when we gather around god's word that is those are all moments of worship and when we do it collectively there's a great amount of power that takes place god says to us that worship ought to be public that means that we ought to desire that as we can, when we are able, in every opportunity to gather together with other believers, whether it be uh, whether it be in the church setting, whether it be in a conference setting, whether it be in a small ship setting, whether it be in a, in a camp setting, or whether it be in all of the above, that we gather together as we have opportunity to worship because there's power there. And when we gather together for public worship, we need to not be afraid to actually worship. You know, a lot of times, especially good old independent fundamental Baptists, we, we get it in our mind when we have this fear of letting go during worship time. We're afraid of what other people are going to think. Uh, we're afraid of what somebody might say if we raise our hand or maybe clap a little or maybe close our eyes or 
uh, or come to an altar, we, we're, we're afraid of what might happen, what somebody might think. The reality is that's what God wants us to do. There's freedom when we gather together in worship uh, collectively. The Spirit of God moves in a mighty way when His people are gathered together. By the way, it's one of the reasons why it's so important that we gather as a church, even though we may have to sit every other row, and even though we may have to uh, social distance it, 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 it to, to ensure safety and health right now, the reality is that even so, it's important that we gather because there's power in public worship. Right? We can we can enjoy and we can worship online, but there's power when we come together. Jesus said we ought to have public worship, but we also have to have private worship. Now, one of, one of the dangers that, that I fear that we face, one of the things that, that maybe we're guilty of is that, is that we, we understand the idea of public worship, even though maybe we don't let go during that moment, at least we show up for the moment sometimes, right? But sometimes we get in our mind that that's enough. Like, I'm, I'm going to show up at church on Sunday, Wednesday night, if the preacher's lucky, I'm going to be there and, 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 and we'll worship and then that's about it. The reality is, is God wants worship to be our lifestyle. He wants worship to be what we do. It ought to permeate every area of our life. So worship also has to be private. Matthew chapter number 6, turn there uh, with me tonight or, or check out the screen behind me. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is speaking. In verse number 1, he says, Take that you do not in your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do your alms, alms let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy nine alms might be in secret. The Father which seeth thee in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites or or as pray standing on the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you shut your door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not the vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that should be heard uh, for their much speaking. You say, listen, listen, there has to be some time in your life Matter. Where worship is not being done because you're trying to show off or show up. Where you just simply worship because you want to worship. Jesus uses the illustration uh, about, he says, he says, listen, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Now, think about that illustration for just a minute, right? Think about your body. Your left hand and your right hand, they're pretty closely connected, right? There's, there's never a point in your life where you ever get Get from them, right? I mean, I could get I could get my uh, my left hand maybe maybe four feet from my right hand because I got short arms. They're always close to one another, but the fact is this: is that my left hand always knows what my right hand's doing to a degree, but my left hand's not impressed with the right hand does because the right hand's not bragging about anything, it's not showing anything off, it's just doing its thing. Right, I'm a right-handed guy. My, 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 my left hand's not impressed when my right hand uh, writes scribbles on a page. It's just doing what it does. And my right hand's not showing off when it does that. It's just doing what it does. And I think that's what Jesus is saying about, about our private worship. Listen, you don't have to show it off. It's just between you and God and you and you. And, and just worship. That's why he talks about the alms and the prayers. He's saying, listen... Have some private time where you're just worshiping God. It's not a big show. It's the way that you live. It's just what you do. And here's the reality. If we can learn to worship in private, and, and again, I think Jesus is, is talking about he's talking about lifestyle, that this is just our heart attitude. This is just, it's just what we do. That we worship in every element and every area of our life. When we learn how to do that, here's what happens is it shows up in our attitudes and our actions. When we live a life of worship, when we have some glory time, uh, and, and glory time for us is happening all the time, 
when I'm, when I'm trying to, to, to learn how to use every element of my life as an opportunity to worship God. And when I'm able to do that, not by putting on a show, but simply by the humble way that I live. That I just worship praising and giving God glory every moment of every day for every circumstance, every situation, every opportunity, everything that I do. When I learn how to do that, it shows up in my attitude, in my actions. I don't have to tell anybody about it. They just naturally see it. You see what happens when we... When, 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 when we have some glory time, and glory time becomes a part of our normal everyday time and permeates everything, our overall demeanor begins to change. The way we think about or talk about God begins to change. The way that we talk to or about people begins to change. The way we look at our possessions and our circumstances it all begins to change when we truly give God glory for all of those elements in our life. When we are continually, then everything in our life begins to change. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. The scripture says, To put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, and kindness, and humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of uh, perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are also called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ will in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. He wraps up this passage as he's talking about how to treat people. Paul says, whatever you're doing, you do it as under the glory of the Lord, to give thanksgiving unto him, to worship him, and to praise him. And everything prior to that statement, Paul say, listen, treat people right. Be kind, be merciful, be humble, be patient, forbear them, forgive them, love them. How do you do that? How, how can you be that way with people? Well, you can be that way when you live a lifestyle and an attitude of giving God continual glory. What happens when, when glory is a part of your private life? And you spend your time thinking about the goodness and greatness of God. That has to affect how you think about, look at, and talk to other people. Because you can't be focused on the glory of God in one moment, while at the same moment being focused on the deficiency or inadequacy of that person in front of you. I think maybe if we would learn how to Truly worship God in every moment our relationship. What about our circumstances, right? If we are if we are worshiping God in every moment in our private life, not just putting on a show on Sunday morning, but but this is how I live every day. And all of a sudden, when those adverse circumstances come in, the difficulty happens, the disappointment comes. It may not change. The outcome or the circumstance, but it changes our attitude in it because I'm so focused on now, who God is is so much bigger than the than the mess around me. That my attitude in the mess now changes because I'm focused on who God is and how great God is and how good He's been to me. All of a sudden, my attitude begins to change. But not only does my attitude change, what happens when the attitude changes, the action changes with it. And it's important that we understand the actions of worship. 
and to learn how to take every action of every moment of every day and utilize it as an opportunity to give God glory. I want you to consider, and I'm going to give you, give you several actions that we can do as, as a way of worship. Things we can intentionally do to just give the glory. Every element of our life. The first one, and this one's a hard one. This one's a hard one for me. If you know me, you can talk to my wife. This is a hard one for me, and it is being still. Psalm 46.10, God said this. He said, listen, just be still and know that I'm God. You know, we live in a hustle and bustle and fast-paced society. We live in a world where we are driven to succeed. We are driven to achieve. We are driven to always be on the go. And, and, and we a lot, a lot of times we, we attribute our value and our worth to that. Sometimes we, we you know, my, my struggle is I feel like I'm being lazy if I sit down and stop. I feel like I'm being a disappointment. But the reality is, is there are times in our life I said, you know what, if you just sit down, be still for a little while. You listen to me. And sometimes I think to be still is an opportunity where we can worship and we can reflect on the glory of God or we can reflect on who God is because we've just severed ourselves for a while. Allow our thoughts to go to Him. We worship when we pray. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, familiar passage of Scripture, uh, verse, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let be made known unto God. You notice he, how he said the praise is with, with thanksgiving. That's a glory element. That's a worship time. God, I want to. I just want to worship you. And you know what? When we stop to pray, it's an element of worship. It's an act of, of honoring God with this extravagant love. And God, I know that we pray and we pour our hearts out to God, it helps us to remember just who He is. And especially when we pray, you know, that this praying is an act of worship. It's more than just asking God to fix things. But it's reminding ourselves in that prayer of who He is and, uh, and adoring His name. We find where singing also is an act of worship. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 tells us to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for the good things unto God. And the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is singing is something we ought to do more than just on Sunday morning. And if you're like me, I, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But to be able to sing praise unto God and to things about Him, just as a reminder of who He is. Those are moments where we catch ourselves and lead ourselves into an attitude of worship. And listen, I understand we can't sing all day, we can't pray all day, we can't be still all day, but all of those things as we do them, just help us to get in the right mindset and the right spirit of God. I'm going to worship you today. I'm going to worship you on my way to work so that I can worship you while I work. I'm going to worship you on my way home so I can worship you in my home. Being taught the word is also uh, another form of worship. When we gather like this on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings or in your small group Bible study or, or maybe you're listening to a podcast or just getting in God's word on your own for your daily devotions. Uh, when we do that, it is a form of worship. And remember what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 says, listen, uh, this book is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto good works. Listen, when we get into God's word, it is a form of worship because we're saying, God, what you say is important. It matters. And listen, if, we only, if we're only in God's word on Sunday morning, what we're really saying is, is God, I don't really value what you have to say. I don't value it enough for me to read it on my own. 
I only valued enough for somebody else to tell me. But if we can learn how to worship God daily by being in his word, all of a sudden his word becomes alive to us and it begins to change us because it reminds us of who God is, how he's in control. I want you to know tonight that working is also worship. These are all just actions that we take. Anytime I'm in God's word, I'm worshiping him. But the reality is, anytime I'm working, I have an opportunity to use my work for worship regardless of work, what the work is, unless, unless by chance you're in some illegal trade. If your trade is not illegal, then it is an opportunity for you to worship. Listen to Psalm 97.17. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. What's the psalmist say? He's saying, listen, let God's beauty be here. And where's God's beauty at? God's beauty is when we perform the work he has called us to do. When we do the work of our hands, Think about my wife, the only one sitting in here on the, on the front row tonight. She's a teacher. When she teaches, she is using the gift that God has given her. And every time she is in that classroom or, you know, getting ready, I guess, starting out here sooner to be online on an iPad. But when she does that, what she doing? She's worshiping God because she is using the gift God has given her. When you go to the plant or you go to the job site, whatever it is that you might do, whatever you do is an opportunity of worship. God's glory is seen in the word of your hand, and you ought to ask God and expect God to receive glory from what you do. And ask him to allow you to use that work, whatever it is, as an opportunity to give glory unto him. Serving is also worship, First Peter chapter 4. Verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praised. And he says, Listen, he says, God's given you some gifts minister serve one another with those things and he says that God will be glorified in that hey when we have an opportunity to serve and that ought to be a part of our life whenever we do it's an opportunity to worship whenever you do something for somebody else whether it's a family member a co-worker somebody in your church or ministry through your church it is opportunity to worship Acts chapter 2, 26 through 47 teaches us this, that fellowshipping with other believers is a form of worship. Acts 2, 46, 47, the, the believers, the Bible says that they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. Listen, God says you, you, can, you can take your fellowship time and turn it into a worship time. When you are gathered together with, a, uh, with another family or several families of believers in your, in your living room or on their back porch or taking vacation together, having a meal together, God says, listen, that's an opportunity for worship. When you as God's people can come together in God's name, be reminded of who he is and show it to him but to each other in that moment. We also find 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 11, that giving is also worship. The Bible says that he that so sparingly will reap, uh, reap also sparingly. He would sow bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you will always sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now he that bent seed to the sower, 
both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. So I said, listen, when, when we give, it's an opportunity to express our thanks. It's an opportunity for us to give God glory. We, we, ought, we have to see our resources in, as an opportunity to simply glorify and worship God. The bottom line is this, and we can give a countless list of other things, but the point is this, is that every aspect of our life is an opportunity for us to glorify God. It ought to be in the front of everything that we do. We ought to desire to give God glory, not because of what he has done, but because of who he is. And we ought to give him glory for who he is through everything that we are able to do. When we have our God time, that's a time where we give him glory. When, when, we, when we have our group time, when we're gathered as a church, you know what, that's a time to give him glory. When you have some gather time, and maybe it's just you and a, and a few other believers gathered together, that is a time to give him glory. When you are going and sharing your faith with somebody and telling them about what God has done for you, that's a time for you to give him glory. When you are having your game time and you are at work and you are slaving away, or at least you feel that way, that is a time for you to give God glory. When you give, whether it be to the church or uh, to a charitable organization, or maybe you're just giving to pay your bills, you know what? That is an opportunity for you to give God the glory. Praise Him for the fact that you have a house with an air conditioner to keep you cool, even though electric bills high. You can still give God the glory for it because you're still blessed. Anytime you gather as, uh, with the generations, that family time, you know, that's a time to give God the glory to look at how he has so blessed you with that family. And that game time, whether you're hunting or fishing or, or shopping or crocheting or whatever it is that you do, that recreation, that downtime, it's an opportunity for you is to give God the glory. And everything in between is an opportunity to give God glory. All of our time should be filled with glory time. And I want you to know this, that God responds to the worship of his people. God responds when we give him glory. In fact, the psalmist in Psalm 22, 3, and I know this is for our theologians out there, this is a little bit of a controversial verse as to exactly what God means when he says these words. Thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. He has a very strong indication that God inhabits or dwells in or lives in the praise of his people. We want to see this principle kind of taught all throughout scripture that, that God loves it when his people worship him. God responds to his people when we worship him. And we worship him and give him glory, not because we think he's going to give us something in return, but that we simply worship him and give him glory because of who he is. He's God. He's creator, sustainer, redeemer. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we should give him glory just because of who he is. And as we give God glory, he then responds. And you know what his response is? His response is, is that he blesses us with a better attitude and he blesses us with better actions. Doesn't always mean he's going to take away or fix all the problems, but he's going to give us the demeanor and the, the mindset that we're going to overcome and get through as we continue to give him glory. So I want to give you just a few practical thoughts as we wrap up tonight about, about glory time. Just a did you actually give God glory? How often do you actually give Him glory? How often do you worship Him? 
Is it just when we gather in public? Is it maybe just those few certain moments of the day if the right song comes on the radio or you're in the right mood? Or do you maybe, maybe you, if you're honest, you say, Preacher, I'm, I'm having a really bad attitude at work or in my home with my kids, with my finances. Whatever it might be, maybe just maybe. Why don't why don't can I challenge us to try this? And maybe that's the case. Maybe if we would focus giving God some glory in those areas, and to do it consistently. I'm not saying that you, you can't give Him glory tonight and everything be changed tomorrow. But what if you consistently and genuinely begin to give God glory for that situation, that circumstance, that person, that thorn in your foot? What if you started giving God glory for that right now? Genuinely begin to worship him in spite of. What if you begin to do that for the next several days, maybe the next several weeks? Do you think maybe things would begin to change? Maybe not share the circumstance, but share your attitude in it to help you have some victory as you get through it. I would encourage you tonight to make a commitment to personally worship God at the beginning of each day. But make it a point, God, I want to, I want to. Designate some time where I can give you some glory. Make a, make a time, make a place for this to happen. I want to encourage you also to make a commitment to fully engage in corporate worship with your church family. And we're going to be sitting on Sunday. Uh, hopefully very soon things are going to go back to normal. But I would encourage you, if you are physically able and healthy, uh, that you come and engage with your church. Can I tell you, when you have that opportunity, I want to encourage you to fully engage in corporate worship. To gather with some believers and for us together for just a little while, forget about everything else, focus only on God. And then I encourage you this, lastly, take some time to consider how you can use your daily activities as forms of worship. God, how? Ask God, God, how can I use my job to worship you? How can I worship you with my family, how can I give you glory in that? How can I how can I worship you and give you glory with my finances and every other element and aspect we talked about tonight? God, how can I live a life where I give you glory? Because when we pray, when we worship Him, everything changes. And it's not that everything changes, but we change. Our perspective changes. Because it helps us to focus on who God is. And when we really see who he is, we realize he's so much bigger than anything else around. Give him the glory tonight. Father, we thank you to be in your house. God, help us tonight to make love. I mean, everything that we do, help us, God, to make it about you. To glorify you and to worship you. And, uh, and, and to just in an extravagant way and love you and to submit to you. God, help us to give you glory in everything that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'll see you Sunday morning.